Peggy? Yes. Hey, it's Justin Cantor. Hi, Justin. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Okay, thank you. Are you feeling all better now? I know when oh, I Oh, yes. You. <laughs> That's all gone. Thank God, yes. Good. It's a pleasure to speak with you, and uh, I've been enjoying listening to Always and Forever, and uh, it's a very well-packaged album as well. Um, it certainly gives some interesting insight into your well-varied career, and uh, it's nice to hear you uh, doing a lot of your own lyrics as well. So, uh, can you tell me about, well, first of all, this is your first English language pop album in quite some time. Oh, and, yes. Uh, how would you describe the musical scope of this new album, Always and Forever? Wow. Um, when Soren approached me, all right, Darren and Soren approached me, it was, it, he told me about Soren, Darren told me about Soren, and he told me that he was primarily a uh, dance song producer, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I've never done anything like that before in, in total. I mean, I did a disco album in 79. It was in English, but it wasn't really up to par with what was happening. Uh, I didn't really like it. I wasn't very much a part of it. And I thought it would be, I would thought it would be interesting to do something like this. But as I told Darren, most important ever is the song is really the song is most important no matter what you do mm -hmm. and and uh i told him to please have sorry who i had not met yet you know send me something mm -hmm. um so that i could sort of see what he was doing so of course he sent me something from curly and i listened to that and i said well this is this is nice stuff but it's not necessarily what i would do mm -hmm. so again Sarn sent me uh, every every day is a new day Okay. And the lyric was not uh, was not acceptable. Let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> Soren had written part of it, but it wasn't. It was. It sounded, or you know, it felt like it was written by a foreigner, okay. not not someone who spoke English. Okay. Or spoke English well. Okay. And um, so I changed. I said to him, "Do you mind if I change anything?" I said, "I like the song, but um, you know, I need to." to change a little bit here and a little bit there. This this line doesn't make sense. This one is grammatically incorrect and so on and so forth. So he said, fine. So I did. Okay. Um, I, I fixed it. I, I didn't redo the whole thing. I took a lot of what, what Thorne had and just, and just um, edited it, mm -hmm. so to speak. And he said, well, I'll send you something else. I just wrote it. And that was, uh, funny enough, it was uh, the second song on the album, which is I Can't Say No to You, mm -hmm. which had no title. And uh, he well, actually the song titles everything, but it really doesn't mean anything. Okay. And and uh, well, you know, you have to because otherwise the songs get lost. You lose and you don't track know of it, right? Song, uh, exactly. You don't know what you're talking about. So he he names everything. Most composers do that, and mm -hmm. um, so I got it here, and I started working on it, and uh, renamed it obviously because that's where the, that's where the title came, where I where I put it, and uh, it just sort of all all started to flow mm -hmm. and he started was he emailing you the music or did he send them to you in the mail or how did that process work oh no it was all, all by email okay all of it. Mm -hmm. um the the song i still follow you darren really wanted something that would be like a follow-up if you will pardon the pun to i will follow him mm -hmm. and i said oh god that's so i don't know that's so using a German word, kitschik, you know, it's so corny, I'm not so sure that's a good idea. And, oh, and you had, you had done that before, like, on that album, you mentioned the Electrifying album, right? Right. It was, yes, but that was the original. That was the original. No, no, I know I'm saying, so you do, you probably weren't wanting to just remake the song itself again. No, no, saying, right? no. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And besides, I didn't want to have anything uh, uh, really... I wanted to, not that I wanted to get away from it, that's not what I'm saying, but mm -hmm. I did not want to just be identified with, with, uh, with I Will Follow Him. Right. I wanted a, a new thing in there. But, but Darren really wanted something that had something to do with follow in there. So I, I thought about it for the longest time, really, and nothing came, and nothing came, and nothing came, and so I wasn't sending any melodies that rendered itself to anything like that, and... Mm -hmm. So one day, um, I was actually going to take a nap here in the living room, and uh, which I do occasionally. That's actually my my 
my emails, uh, my computer was on the dining table. So it was always very, very close by. I was just like, taking a, a rest, if you will, a pause. Right, right. Yeah, I got that. And I started I to get an idea for a lyric, which I, I, I said, oh, please leave me alone. I just want to go to sleep now. And, uh, <laughs> it, you know, one line after the other kept coming up. And I said, please leave me alone. I'd like to take a nap. And I said, okay, I'll get up. So I did. And I went to the computer, and I literally wrote the song and or wrote the lyric in 20 minutes. Well, that's... And I sent I sent it to Sarn, uh-huh. and he he had a melody for me the next morning. Wow! Now, when you talk about like your relationship writing with Sorn and how a lot of times he'll send you melodies and then you'll write lyrics, um, does it always go that way? Like, say for instance, with um, a pop classic that you wrote, which honestly I didn't realize that you had written until. Um, uh, finding out via Soren, which was... Uh, oh, when, when the, the rain, rain begins to fall. Right, right. Um, yeah. Like, was that the same thing where um, your co-writers, they the, or the music writers had done the music and then you added lyrics, or was that... No, that was that was a different time entirely. First of all, it was the 80s. I had this band. I was part of a band, and uh, our band was called BMW, actually. BMW, and okay. BMW, because of our last names. We were writing a lot of stuff at that time, because we were, we were just writing for our, for our band, for us. And uh, we used to write together. Okay. Um, uh, every once in a while, I would like to go home and take the song with me and finish the lyric, or you know, leave a couple of words out and it would be uh, um, helped by one of the other two guys or just Steve. Uh-huh. Or sometimes I would come up with a melody and then we would all come up with the lyric. And it, it, that's how it worked, basically. We really co-wrote a lot of things together. And how did it end up uh, be, coming to be recorded by Jermaine Jackson, Pia Zadora, who had a big international hit with it? Um, we were, again, I was a band. I had a band. Mm-hmm. Um, we were doing a showcase, mm-hmm. and a friend of ours, his name is Jack White. Oh, right, the producer of it. Okay. It's a producer, exactly. Yeah. And uh, he was in California. He's German, as it happened. Right, And that's right. he was in California at the time, and I, I said to him, look, we're having a showcase. You want to come by and, you know, and hang out and see our band and he said fine so we did that's exactly what happened and when he heard when the rain begins to fall he said that's exactly the kind of song i would like for for pia zadora and she's you know they want to do a a duet with jermaine jackson and we hemmed and we hawed because i really didn't want to give it up frankly Mm -hmm. because it's a great song it's just a great song so we we made other concessions and uh you know talked about it amongst ourselves and it sort of happened, if you will, that, that he did then do it with them, copied our arrangement completely, and uh, recorded it with, with Jermaine Jackson and, and Pia Zadora. And uh, he's also well-known not just as a producer, but he you know puts a lot of promotion into his things, and so, or did at that time. Uh-huh. And um, so he did. He promoted the hell out of it. And, and he made it, uh, you know, with, with all of it, as a fact, and the fact that it's a really great song, well, uh, it went to number one all over Europe. Uh, let's talk a, a little bit about the history of, um, uh, or the beginnings of your career, um, and specifically with I Will Follow Him, which, you know, was a very defining moment for you. Um, with the song, you know, being written, and again, I don't know if my pronunciations are right, but Frank Purcell, Paul Marriott, um, and the translation by Norman Gimbel. Um, this right. song has an interesting history, you know, even before yes, you does. came into the picture with it. So, like, can you talk a little bit about that, uh, the history of it and how it, you know, came into your hands and so forth? Well, I was with RCA at that time. My producers were Hugo and Luigi, which, who were very, very popular at that time and extremely successful. So I was very lucky to get them as producers in that respect. Mm-hmm. So they got a lot of press. They got a lot of attention, mm-hmm. which is not bad for whoever they're producing, obviously. Right. And um, I had produced a song called Little Me already that had gone on the market that was from a uh, musical, Little Me. Yeah. Which was not a successful musical. And the song is, even though I like the song, it is not a commercial song. It's not easy to sing with. It changes keys and it, it does weird things in there musically. 
which is great if you like music, but not always if you like to sing along. That's true. And so, yeah. It's a cute uh, it's song, It's not a sing-along though. kind of... Yeah, it yeah. is a cute song, but yeah. it's not a sing-along kind of song, which is what the 60s were at that time. Everybody yeah. knew the words, and everybody sang along, and this was not one of those. 